All right. Well, again, I've already read the, uh, the text, but let me just read it again to uh, point out what we're looking at this morning, this particular deception of the enemy. Uh, John 16, verses 1 through 3. <clears throat> uh, Jesus uh, said to his disciples in, in the upper room, These things I have spoken to you, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. Now, Jesus obviously is telling us if they had known the Father, they wouldn't be doing this. They are under a deception, and that deception is pretty powerful. They thought, uh, they would think that they are serving God as they are putting the disciples or the apostles um, to death. Satan's deceptions are, are very powerful in the unbelieving world, but they're also powerful for even, even among believers. Okay, so let's, uh, let's begin just by a quick review of what we've seen. Now, we, we have seen that we have an adversary. His name is the devil. And he hates us, okay? He hates us. He wants nothing less than to destroy us. Jonathan Edwards said that Satan, knowing that he's going to be miserable from all eternity, wants to make us miserable with him. He wants to bring us down into hell. And, of course, being the image of God, he also wants to destroy us because we are like God. But since he can't do that, in the life of a believer, he'll do everything he can to drag us down spiritually. You might say to neutralize us, put us on the sidelines, maybe even to make us descend into a deep depression, always wondering whether or not we really belong to the Lord. So that's all we can think about, you know, and we get actually nothing done. We don't serve the Lord at all, just kind of suffer our entire lives. He wants to make us suffer. He wants to neutralize us, okay, to weaken our love and our effectiveness for the Lord. Now, that's why Peter tells us that we need to be watchful and we need to be ready for when he attacks. Now, again, you know, we are talking about something that is really happening, and it's happening to each one of us, which is why Peter addresses it not to the apostles, not just to those who are important in the church, so to speak. Everyone's important to the Lord, right? But to everyone in the church, when he says in 1 Peter 5, 8, be of sober spirit, be on the alert. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Now, if we don't believe that, if we don't take that seriously, Satan has already won. He's already deceived us, and he's going to eat us up, so to speak, and we're not going to be able to do what the Lord calls us to do. Now, even as we would not turn our backs on somebody holding a gun who's threatening to kill us, you know, we should not turn our backs on Satan because he has much worse things that he would like to do to us. You know, he would love to destroy us if he could. Jesus calls him the strong man, and his power makes him very dangerous, which is why we need to be equipped with spiritual weapons. And we've seen that he's very good at what he does. He's good at getting the saints to fall. Again, just think of David, think of Peter, you know, and not just them, but all of them, okay, fell in one way or another. The disciples all left him when he was um, arrested on that particular night. So we cannot afford to be ignorant of how the devil works. Now, so far, we've seen a couple of major things. Satan, and I think we could probably deduce this just from reason, he'll attack us where we're the weakest, not the strongest, and he knows exactly where that is. He has studied us long enough to know where we're vulnerable. And the second thing we saw is the way he will attack us is by using deception. He wants to deceive us to fall into that particular weakness. Now, from here on, uh, Thomas Brooks is going to show us the many different ways in which he can deceive us. Last week, we looked at his first deception. He'll try to get us to look at sin as something desirable. He'll draw our attention to the pleasure that it promises. Boy, doesn't Bathsheba look good bathing on the roof, right? Um, or wouldn't it be to my advantage to deny Christ so that I don't get killed along with him? So he dangles the bait in front of our eyes, but he conceals 
the hook or the injury that it's going to bring us. Again, remember Adam and Eve. He comes up to to Eve and says, you will surely not die. Takes the hook and he kind of pushes it aside and hides it. And then he shows them this wonderful bait, this desirability of the tree. You shall be like God. And they both took the bait and they were hooked. And we know the consequences of that were uh, pretty terrible for them and for the whole human race. That's the reason why we die. That's the reason why we get sick. That's the reason why we have all these difficulties we have. That's the reason why people go to hell is because Satan was so effective in that particular deception. And so let me just remind you again of what Brooks said about escaping that particular deception. First of all, stay away from sin as far as you possibly can. If you play with fire, you're going to get burned. He said, remember that those sin may give some pleasure. And uh, remember how Moses, you know, set aside Egypt and the passing pleasures of sin, it will bring far more pain because if Moses had stayed in Egypt, he would have been destroyed with Egypt. But instead, he suffered with the people of God and now he'll be forever glorified with his Savior. Uh, If we fall into sin, this particular sin, any sin, we will also lose what is most precious. Whenever we sin, again, we offend the Spirit of God. We offend him. His work is quenched, which means... It's weakened because he withdraws from us somewhat, his influence. And that brings a loss of joy and comfort and also our love and delight in the Lord will weaken. And again, Brooks would remind us of what David wrote when he fell into that sin with Bathsheba in Psalm 51, verse 12. Restore to me the joy of your salvation. And why would it need to be restored except that he had lost it? because of the sins that he had committed, because Satan was successful in causing him to fall. We need to remember that sin is deceitful. And again, using uh, uh, Brooks's characteristic, colorful way of putting it, he said, you know, Delilah looked to Samson like she was going to give him some pleasure, but instead she betrayed him to the Philistines. <laughs> okay? Well, sin promises to do the same thing but ultimately will betray us into the hands of the devil who will then have the grounds that he needs to accuse us and to make us miserable. So stay away from sin. Avoid it as as much as you can and and see it. Now, this next deception is similar, but it's different. And I should say that perhaps the remedies would work for the first one as well. So this morning, we're going to consider this, that he can also deceive us, fool us, fool us into thinking that sin is actually something virtuous, something that is good. It would be good for us to do this, right? Uh, When it isn't, when it's actually sin. Okay, so Brooks puts it this way. The devil paints sin with virtue's colors. Okay, so the first one is, He shows you the golden bait, but he hides the hook. And again, these are maybe more concrete ways of remembering these things. In this case, he takes the sin and he paints it and makes it look beautiful. So you think it's actually something good. Now again, this isn't the same as the first deception. Okay, showing us the bait, but hiding the hook. You see, because there, the bait that Satan uses is the sin itself. And he doesn't try to cover over what it is, right? He simply shows us what we're most liable to and he, he hides the consequences and so he's, he's really making it look, again, pleasurable. The sin itself, pleasurable. And it's the pleasure that draws us to it that we think we're going to get. Just like the fish thinks he's going to get a you know, mouthful of food but instead gets the hook uh, when you're out fishing. In this case, he disguises the sin and he makes it look like something other than what it really is. He makes it look good rather than evil. Now again, just remember what we heard Paul telling Timothy last week, how the devil works to try to make, to try to make us look at things in the wrong way. Okay? That's why he says to Timothy, in gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, that the Lord might bring them to their senses. And that literally means to make them see things rightly again so that they might escape this snare of the devil. 
the devil deceives and he makes us think wrongly about things and we need to see them again rightly and that's what the Word of God and correction is really all about. Now Brooks points out that if Satan were to show us sin as it really is, that we would do everything we could to avoid it in most cases. That's why he has to bring a deception to it. In this case, painting it with a veneer of virtue. Okay, and I was thinking as I was thinking about this, you know, maybe a, a more, um, I'm not sure if this, if this illustration is really up to date anymore, but think of a used car salesman who knows he's got a wreck, you know, but instead he takes it, does a little bit of Bondo work on it, gets rid of the rust and puts a nice shiny coat of paint on it so he can deceive his customer into thinking that that car is really a good buy when it's really just a pile of junk. Okay, Satan conceals the sin so that he might more easily make us fall into it. We think we're getting a shiny new vehicle, but it's like Barney's new car. I don't know if you ever saw that episode of Andy Griffith, but it turns out to be this, this total lemon, right? Everything goes wrong with it, okay? Well, sin, again, will make everything go wrong. Okay, so here's a few examples of this, and I think um, perhaps we'll, we'll get the point. Now, we know that greed is sin. Paul writes to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6, verse 10, For the love of money is a root of all sorts of evil, and some, by longing for it, have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many griefs. 1 Timothy 6, 10. Now, he also tells the Colossians in Colossians 3, 5, that covetousness amounts to idolatry. And I think the reasoning is, is like this. When wealth, the wealth we possess, moves from being something that we possess and use for, for God's glory to something that possesses us so that we begin to work harder and harder to gain more and more of it and we become more and more reluctant to give it up you know, think Ebenezer Scrooge. You know, I think you're all familiar with uh, Christmas Carol. When our love for money becomes greater than our love for God, and to use that money as he intends that we use it, then it becomes an idol to us. It's possessed us. Now, if we understood money in that light, you know, and, and saw that that's the way we were treating our wealth, we'd, we'd back away from it. But... Satan has a way of making us believe that this accumulation of wealth and this reluctance to give it away or, you know, to use it for the Lord's purposes as he would have us to is really a good thing. If he can do that, then perhaps he'll get us to fall into this sin. So he recasts it. He makes us think differently about it. Instead, he says that that's just simply good stewardship, you know. Other people aren't working hard. I am. I, that's why I should benefit from it, but they shouldn't. You know, we're just being prudent with our resources. Or he might say, there are others who have far more than we have, so why should I give what little I have to support the works that God says I should support when there are others who can do it much more easily? And again, if I say that, just think about that one instance in the Bible that rebukes all of us which is the widow who had the two mites, basically two cents, two pennies, and she puts it into the temple because she loves God and she wants to support his work. And Jesus, as he observes her, says, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all these other people combined, even the rich with their bags of money, because she put everything that she had in there because she trusted that God was going to take care of her needs. Or Satan also works, uh, as you know, from the health, and uh, the, the health and wealth gurus. You know, their, their message is this, that, that God blesses those who are righteous with great wealth. And they ought to enjoy that wealth. Uh, God wants us to have a higher standard of living, you know. And um, I, I, I happen to be in that movement for a while, so I have examples of that. Uh, Oral Roberts, you know, uh, talked about how when we give to his ministry... We're sending up materials into heaven where God's going to take those materials and, and build it into a mansion, right? So what kind of a mansion do you want in heaven? You, know, you want some kind of a tar paper shack that's down by the railroad tracks, or do you want something really nice? Well, if you give more, you'll have something really nice. And he's appealing, again, to our lusts. 
See, that's what Satan is doing. Everything that Oral Roberts said, probably in, in, in maybe many cases, if not most, was a message of the devil. It was a lie, right? He, the devil hides the fact that Jesus tells us in Matthew chapter 6 that we cannot serve wealth and God. Okay? We can't become a servant to our wealth. It cannot possess us. We need to possess it and use it for God's glory. So again, Satan has a way of getting us to look at things differently. Uh, the fear of man is another sin that we often fall into. Okay, Jesus tells us in Matthew 10, verse 28, do not fear those who kill the body, but are unable to kill the soul, but rather fear him who is able to destroy both soul and body in, in hell. And what Jesus is saying here is fear God. Okay? He's the one that can do that to your soul and body in hell. Fear him. But don't be afraid of man. Solomon writes in Proverbs 29, verse 25, the fear of man brings a snare, but he who trusts in the Lord will be exalted. That's exactly what Jesus was saying. Now, the problem is fear can keep us from doing what our Lord calls us to do, which is to warn others of the danger that they're in, to point them to Christ, um, that they might be saved. Okay? Now, can we just imagine what our situation would be like today if the apostles had fallen into this particular sin and they didn't tell anybody else because they were afraid of what was going to happen to them? Or what about those who actually brought the gospel to us? What if they had been afraid of us? We never would have heard the gospel. Well, Satan tells us this is just being wise, you know. If we tell other people the truth, we're going to risk losing the relationship that we have with them. They'll, they'll hate us. They'll, they'll avoid us. Uh, we'll be singled out by the in-group as being on the outside. I mean, you know, if, if you've ever been in a place where you're working closely with unbelievers and they come to know that you're a Christian because you make yourself known, you, you do find yourself on the outside, you know. And the question is, um, you know, Satan's going to tell you well, that's not a good thing, you know. You don't want that to happen to you. Um, and especially if you tell your children. And if you confront them with their sins, oh, I'm going to lose my relationship with my child and I don't want that to happen. We knew a Christian couple that, um, oh, in church years ago when we were in college and so forth, who um, their, uh, their daughter got involved with a young man who was an unbeliever and the college he was going to and they were committing sexual sin and the parents didn't want to confront it because they were afraid that when they got married they'd want nothing to do with them. And so they didn't say anything. Okay. So Satan is going to convince us that's the wrong thing to do. Your children are going to turn away from you. People are going to turn away from you. Well, again, that might be the result, right? Jesus did say, all, you will be hated by all men on my account. Uh, if they hated me, they're also going to hate you. But think about what happens if we don't tell them the truth. You know, even if, let's say, this couple does get married down the road... They're still guilty of that sexual sin until they actually repent. They have to acknowledge that that sin, that, that action is a sin, and they need to repent. The fact that they're doing the right thing now doesn't make all the bad go away. So they still have to be confronted. They still have to be told the truth. What if we don't tell them the truth? Well, then they continue in their sin, and they may never actually come to faith in Christ and, you know, something that uh, the Puritans pointed out that we don't often think about is this, that we might be partly responsible for their destruction because we're not telling them the truth. If we have the opportunity, we need to speak to them. Like the watchman on the wall, we have a certain responsibility. If I warn them, if I tell you to warn them and you don't warn them, they'll die, but their blood I will require at your hands. Well, so there's a couple of examples of sins. Now, here's another example. Satan can also paint soul-condemning heresies with the colors of virtue, okay? He can change our way of thinking about the truth. For instance, James tells us that faith without works is dead, right? If the faith that we lay claim to does not produce obedience to God, then it is not saving faith. Okay, that's what James is telling us. Ah, you know, but Satan tells us, 
if we really believe the doctrine of justification by grace through faith alone, which the Apostle Paul teaches, to say that we must obey God is really a heresy. And you know, there are professing Christians who will go to the wall on that particular point. I went to a college where virtually every professor believed that and just about every student as well because that's what they were being taught. If you say that as a Christian you must obey God, you must obey God, then you're a legalist and you've destroyed the gospel. Ah, you see, but that's Satan's uh, deception, isn't it? He's blinded their eyes to the difference between necessary works or the, the evidences, the fruits of justification of a true saving faith. It changes the way I live. And meritorious works, okay? We know that we cannot earn justification by our works. That would be a heresy. Okay? That destroys the gospel. That's legalism. But if we are justified by God's grace through faith alone, obedience must necessarily follow. Faith without works is dead, dead faith, a faith that cannot save. Now, here's another example. Uh, perhaps I should have put this in the first category, but it is a doctrinal issue. God tells us that to be unequally yoked to an unbeliever in marriage is sin. But how many times has Satan persuaded many a young lady to marry an unbeliever, convincing them that this is how God is going to save them? That's a very uh, powerful deception that the enemy uses because they'll just see you living like Christ and they'll come to faith in Christ. Well, here's another example. Sexual relationships outside of marriage is sin. But the devil will try to convince us otherwise. You know, when Donna and I were in Calvary Chapel years ago, virtually every engaged couple that we knew of, we had heard through the grapevine, not didn't see it or didn't hear from them, but they were committing sexual immorality before they got married, believing that since they were getting married anyway, it was going to be okay. And as a matter of fact, it might actually draw them closer together. But here again, Satan is taking fornication which God condemns, and he says no one who commits this sin is going to enter the kingdom of heaven unless, of course, they repent and they're cleansed. He says that's a good thing, and, and you ought to do it because of these extenuating circumstances. So again, the idea here is that Satan will try to get us to view sin as a virtue uh, so that he can get us more easily to fall into it, and sadly, he's done this to all of us. He has done it to all of us. Now, obviously, the examples of this are too numerous to... Uh, to be able to um, you know, exhaustively detail. But I think we get the idea. So what does Brooks tell us to do about this deception? Well, first of all, he reminds us this, that this veneer of, of, of virtue, this paint job, you see, doesn't really change the nature of what's underneath. It's still a wreck. It's, it's still perhaps going to lead to your death if you get in it and drive down the road, so to speak. If you fall into it, it's, it's still gonna have the same effect. Okay, so he uses these kind of illustrations. A poisonous pill, you know, doesn't become any less poisonous because you put it into a container that contains medicine, okay? A wolf does not change its nature when it puts on sheep's clothing, and the devil is no less dangerous when he appears as an angel of light. As a matter of fact, he becomes more dangerous, okay? The same is true of sin. It may appear good, but it is still evil, and that sin would condemn us forever to hell if not for God's grace. So he says, first of all, realize that even though it looks different, it's still the same. Secondly, sin is more dangerous when we see it as virtuous and when we see it as good because we're more likely to fall into it. It becomes more dangerous. Not because of the effects, they're still the same, but because we're more likely to actually be deceived by the enemy. Now, I thought John Bunyan described this temptation well in Pilgrim's Progress. In the episode of what's called Bypath Meadows, maybe you, remind, you remember that, I'll, I'll read a little bit about it. But, um, you know, Pil Pilgrim and Hopeful are walking along, and their, their journey is right along the river of life. So they had this source of refreshment all along the way. 
But then they reached the point where it began to diverge, and that's where we, we take up uh, the story here. Let me read you a couple of ex uh, extended quotes. He says, Now I beheld in my dream that they, that's Christian and Pilgrim, uh, had not journeyed far, but the river of life and the way, the way in which they were supposed to be walking for a time parted, at which they were not a little sorry, yet they dared not go out of the way. Now the way from the river was rough, and their feet were tender because of their travels, so they were discouraged because of the way. Wherefore, still as they went on, they wished for a better way. Now a little before them, there was on the left hand of the road a meadow and a stile. A stile is a place where people can pass through, but the animals can't get through. A stile to go over into it. And that meadow is called Bypath Meadow. Then said Christian to his fellow, if this meadow lies alongside our way, let's go over into it. Then he went to the stile to see, and behold, a path lay along by the way on the other side of the fence. It is according to my wish, said Christian. Here is the easiest going. Come, good hopeful, and let us go over. But hopeful says, but what if the path should lead us out of the way? That is not likely, said Christian. Look, doesn't it go along by the wayside? So hopeful, being persuaded by his fellow, went after him over the stile. When they were gone over and were got into the path, they found it very easy for their feet. And with all, they, looking before them, saw a man walking as they did, and his name was Vain Confidence. So they called after him and asked him whether, uh, whether, where that way led. He said, to the celestial gate. Look, said Christian, did I not tell you so? By this you may see we are right. So they followed, and he went before them. But behold, the night came on, and it grew very dark, so that they were behind. They that were behind lost the sight of him that went ahead. Now, they were, they were deceived into thinking this easier road was going the same way. Uh, along came this man, vain confidence, to get the point there, who said the path leads to the celestial city. So they were deceived by both of these things. And what happened? Well, vain confidence ahead fell into a pit and perished. And giant despair found Christian and hopeful on his property. He locked them into his dungeon, uh, which in, was in the castle, or excuse me, in the uh, castle called Doubting Castle. Now, staying on the rough path represents obedience and the difficulty of obeying the Lord. Getting off the path represents sin. It, it's easier. But that sin looked good. It would take them where they wanted to go, you know, and it was an easier way. And so they crossed into the meadow. They compromised their obedience. And the result was in Doubting Castle, they lost their assurance, okay? And now they were wondering whether they were Christians at all and whether they would ever get out of that, that cloud of guilt that was oppressing them. So they lost their joy. They lost that peace, that comfort, and all the things that comes from being filled with the Spirit because, again, they compromised. They listened to Satan, got out of the way. Third, Brooks tells us we need to look at sin, you know, up front as we're going to see it in a few hours. Now, once Satan gets us to fall, do you think that veneer is going to stay on the sin? Do you think it's still going to look like a good thing? No, because he's going to rip it off. And he's going to show us sin's true colors. Now, again, Christian and doubtful, locked up in Doubting Castle. See what the consequence was for them. As soon as, you know, the, um, they were fallen into the sin, Satan rips off the veneer and they begin going through a series of downward steps. And that, you see, is what we will experience when we fall into sin. See it for what it's going to bring, not for what it promises now, another way Brooks suggests that we should look at that sin is to look at it as though we are standing before God on the day of judgment. We had not actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, and now this sin is going to speak against me and condemn me to hell forever. If we see it in that light, then perhaps we'll turn away from it. Now, thankfully, by God's grace... Our sins are not going to weigh us down into hell. They have all been forgiven. We are going to be presented before him on that day, blameless because of the righteousness of Christ and his atoning death. But you see, if we see it from that perspective, 
that would go a long ways in showing us the danger of it and staying away from it. Now, finally, Brooks tells us that we should think about what these sins cost the Lord Jesus. Now, Luther once wrote that one drop of Christ's blood was worth more than heaven and earth, and it is true. Now, remember, when we think in those terms, don't think that it's the blood that takes away our sins. You know, that's kind of a, a, um, a misconception. Some believe that Christ's blood is, is kept up in, in heaven. There's a bowl of it there, and whenever a sinner repents, God takes it and applies it to us. That's not how it works. The shedding of blood is simply the pouring out of the life of Christ to death. He died for our sins, and that's where the blood comes in. That's what the significance of the blood is. But we would still agree with Luther that one drop of blood, of Christ's, of Christ's blood, even, you know, anything that has to do with him is more valuable than heaven and earth because he has infinite value. But this is what it cost the Son of God in order to forgive us. Now, Brooks writes this. He says that Christ should come from the eternal bosom of his Father to a region of sorrow and death, that God should be manifested in the flesh, the Creator made a creature, that the head before which the angels do cast down their crowns should be crowned with thorns, and those eyes purer than the sun put out by the darkness of death, those ears which heard nothing but hallelujahs of saints and angels to hear the blasphemies of the multitude, that face that was fairer than the sons of men to be spit upon by those beastly wretched Jews, that mouth and tongue that spoke as never man spoke, accused for blasphemy, those hands that freely swayed the scepter of heaven nailed to the cross, his soul comfortless and forsaken, and all this for those very sins that Satan paints and puts fine colors upon. Oh, how should the consideration of this stir up the soul against it and work the soul to fly from it and to use all holy means whereby sin may be subdued and destroyed. See, the problem is we, we often take God's grace for granted. You know, as Paul addresses to the Romans in Romans chapter 6, should we sin that grace may abound? We almost don't even think twice about it because we know trusting in Christ the sins are covered, but let's not forget, he says, what it took to bring about the forgiveness of those sins, the great sacrifice and payment that was made. How can we set that all aside and just simply give in to it? Now, I think that would apply to any of the sins, any of the deceptions that the enemy has. So we really need to think about that, particularly as we're coming to the Lord's table. So if we could see it from that perspective, how much would it keep us from so easily falling into it? That's why we always need to keep our eyes on the cross, to keep the cross before us at all times, to remember not only what Jesus paid, but also why he paid it. Let's not forget that he gave his life out of his great love for us to deliver us from the danger that we were in because of our sins. That was the only way we could possibly be forgiven. And so Jesus willingly goes to the cross and lays down his life to cleanse and forgive us. We need to keep that continually before our eyes, and that will go a long ways to keeping us from falling into sin. Well, let's, um, let's bow for a moment of prayer. As we bear these things in mind, let's remember that as we come to the table, our Lord Jesus Christ is going to be saying to us in the sacrament that his body was broken, his blood was shed, so that we might be cleansed, that we might be forgiven. And that's a very precious thing to receive from him. Let's spend just a couple of moments in prayer, uh, preparing ourselves for the table.